I would not have believed in a million years, although I've come to Toronto numerous times to speak, that I would ever be asked to talk about the topic that is the subject for this evening. We are at a special time in the calendar. Uh, anybody speak Yiddish here? Okay, a few zwischen, between. Two major moments. Yom HaShoah on one side, Yom Atzmaut on the other. And since you did bring up my age, I lived through the two most remarkable periods in Jewish history. Some of you here probably join me in that. It was the worst of times, and it was the best of times. Now, I think that I'm allowed to use this descriptive for myself. I am a survivor. I was not in the camps. I was in Europe, and we fled because we were afraid that Hitler Marchemo would come. And in 1941, I was on the last boat out of Europe together with my family, the very last one that made it. And uh, we were in a cattle boat that's been written up, the Navamar. Uh, it's been in books. It was worse than a concentration camp in some ways. People died on the journey. So I lived through something. But I want to tell you what I believe firmly since it was Hitler's goal to kill every Jew in the world, that means every one of you here, every one of your parents is a survivor. We survived the plot to destroy, to utterly decimate, to kill every single Jew in the world. And we are here. So we are survivors, and we lived through, if you didn't live through it, so you experience it indirectly now, we are all aware, hopefully, of the tragedy. And then in the span of three years, everything turned around, 1948, end of, 1945, end of the Holocaust, 1948, the establishment of the State of Israel. Absolutely remarkable. I had a member of my congregation who was in Auschwitz. He came out, one of the few survivors, and he looked around, and he told me, I was sure that I and the few other people here, Jews, are the only Jews left in the world. And... It is beyond reason, beyond belief, that three years later, Israel was established. And at that point, I and many others firmly believed what became the slogan for the Jewish people, never again, never again. Because at that time, and for those of you who didn't live through it, let me tell you the good part of it, the tragedy was the Holocaust, and the aftermath was the world suddenly recognizing that the Jews represent the canary bird in the coal mines. You know that in the coal mines, when they wanted to know whether the fumes were so bad that they would kill, but people were not sensitive enough to detect them, they would send a canary in, and the canaries would die before the people, and that would be a siman, a sign. The Jews are the canary birds of history, because invariably, when tyrants, when despots, when the ultimate dictators come, they pick first on the Jews, because we're the easiest target, but the world should stop and listen, because you're next. Do you know what Hitler Yamachimo said? Hitler made clear the reason he hates the Jews so much is because the Jews are the conscience of humankind and that is a wound as harmful as circumcision. 
The Jews want to give the world a conscience, and we choose to be barbarians. I didn't make that up. Hitler said that. Today, you know, if anybody has a question, you can always Google it. Hitler said in exactly those words. We are the conscience of the world, and who the hell wants a conscience? Because that will force you to recognize the difference between right and wrong. And Hitler did not want to do that. And had Hitler succeeded, there would not have been any more civilized people on earth. Civilization would be over. And I dare say to you that in the aftermath of the Holocaust, most of the world, well, perhaps that's going a bit far. I would say a goodly portion of the world understood that this could never happen again, that the anti-Semitism spewed by Hitler was so disruptive, so much a sickness, it was a cancer that could destroy us all. And therefore, the Jews for a while were looked up to with respect. We were honored, we were the heroes for a while. Never happened before. Paul Krubin said, Paul Krubin, Nobel Prize winner, there are only three realities in life. Death, taxes, and anti-Semitism. Well, that was true for many centuries. But in the aftermath of the Holocaust, the world saw that when anti-Semitism is allowed free reign, when anti-Semitism is not even looked askance at, when, when it could be written up in the New York Times and say, well, I don't see about anything wrong with this cartoon, at first, at first, until we reacted, the world, for a while, understood. More, I will tell you a personal experience, and that really puts the focus on it. I travel a lot. And some years back, I had a speaking engagement in Mexico. I needed to make a stopover in Dallas, Texas. Two hours waiting for my next flight. I'm sitting on a bench with a Sefer, a Hebrew book. And a kippah is on my head, of course. A priest is walking by. He's almost past me. And then he stops. He says, Excuse me, sir. I notice your head covering. I notice that seems to be a Hebrew book. Are you by any chance a rabbi? I said, yeah, yes, I am. He said, this is my lucky day. He says, look, I know the verse in Genesis where God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and through you will the world be blessed. And he says, you know, I've been looking for a rabbi all my life. I don't see too many of them here. He was an evangelical. He said, I believe what the Bible says, and all my life I've been waiting to meet a rabbi to ask him a question. Would you, rabbi, give me a blessing? There's nothing more that I would want in life than to receive a blessing from a rabbi. I was a rabbi for sure <laughs> for 40 years. No Jew ever asked me for that. <laughs> but he asked it with full conviction that a bracha, a blessing from a rabbi is truly meaningful and a blessing from the Jews is something beyond words. And so of course, I said in Hebrew and in English, the priestly benediction. He had tears in his eyes. He cried and he thanked me. Do you understand what Vasagyamol given is given 15, 20 years ago? What was, was. And people understood that how you treat the Jews is how you will be either blessed or cursed by God. Are you familiar with how historians prove that prediction and that statement from Bereshit, from Genesis? 1492, what happened? Spain kicked its Jews out. Golden age of Spain. Spain was the most powerful, 
most important country in the world that decided to kick the Jews out. 1492, pretty interesting, isn't it? So God says, okay, you close the doors in one place, we will open the doors for them in another, and America welcomes them. And until now, America was the most hospitable country in the world to the Jews, and America became most successful. Now Canada subsequently also became very warm and welcoming to the Jewish people, and Canada was blessed. And so they are, and so they will be until chas v'shalom. The key to a country's success, ask evangelicals, ask historians, ask rabbis, ask some Jews, not our youth. That's the subject tonight. We'll get back to that. But ask those who understand and they will tell you the Torah was right and the Torah predicted something that is dramatic and historically accurate. The world is judged on the basis of its treatment of the Jews. And so it was. And that's why with that lengthy introduction, I tell you, I am afraid. I am afraid for Europe. I'm afraid for countries around the world who have changed their attitude to Jews. And I'm even a little bit afraid for America. <sighs> rabbi Mervis, chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, he just said recently, when he went to interview for the position of chief rabbi, they asked him, amongst other questions, what do you think about the problem of anti-Semitism today? And Rabbi Merva said, I took a white sheet of paper, I asked for a pencil, and I put a little dot in the middle of the page. And he said, I told them anti-Semitism is that one little dot on a white page. And just recently, Rabbi Merva said, now I would draw a huge circle of black. <sighs> I uh, teach at Yeshiva University, and I have students coming from around the world. But I am extremely sensitive to where they come from in order for me to know where the greatest anti-Semitism exists so that I know where my students are drawn from. And I went through a time when I had more Russian Jews, Jewish youngsters coming than from anywhere else. I went through a time when Jews from Iran came, and etc. Tell me, where are most of my foreign students from today? France. 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 Egalité, right? Liberté, fraternité. France, because their parents say there is no future here anymore. <sighs> Did you read the story about what happened in Berlin? There was an Arab who said that all this stuff that I'm reading is exaggerated and I'm going to prove it. And so the Arab put on a kippah, a yarmulke, and went in the street of Berlin, and guess what? He got beaten up to within an inch of his life. Oh, so it's true. I was in Italy. I was in Rome. I had heard that when you are in Europe today, you no longer wear this, you wear a baseball cap. So the way in which to tell Jews in Europe today is if he's a New York Yankee or a, you know, some baseball cap, de rigueur. I was walking with the chief rabbi in the street and he was wearing a kippah and I was wearing a baseball cap because I had been warned and I said, but I to I'm told that you're not allowed to do that anymore. And he said, uh, uh, why don't you look around? So there were five Israeli starkers, security guys, 
surrounding him. So he, he could walk with a kippah. The average person, impossible today. In Europe, after the years of the Holocaust, where after we had learned that this is a sickness that could destroy the country in which we are, after we should have known better. And how do you think I feel in the United States of America? No, it's not a huge thing yet, but San Diego is a horror. And I would like, this is being videoed and students will watch this, and I want them to hear the most powerful sentence that Rabbi Goldstein said in the aftermath of the attack. He said, they tried to kill me because I am a Jew. So let's not forget the real motivation and let me repeat that, because I am a Jew. If we bring blessing to every country, and every country has a lengthy list of the people who did the most for the country, and Jews, 1% of the country, half a percent, are in the top, top rung of every, every achievement in every country. How do you explain anti-Semitism? How do you explain permitting this hatred and oft times encouraging it? What's the answer? And the answer is in the Talmud. And the Talmud tells the story. The Emperor Hadrian went out one day, and as he's walking, a Jew spots him, sees the Emperor, and says, Oh, Emperor, I wish you a good day. And Hadrian says, The nerve a Jew speaking to me, how dare he speak to me? Off with his head, and they kill him. Next day, he's out walking again, a Jew sees him. He says, I know what happened yesterday. Uh-oh. And he doesn't say a word. And the emperor turns to his aides and says, do you imagine the nerve of that Jew not even greeting the emperor? Off with his head. So they ask him yesterday this and today that. And Hadrian answers according to the Talmud, who says it has to make sense. Every Jew deserves what I commanded. It's against the Jew. What's the logic? There is no logic. But there is something else. And this, I'm going to be getting to solutions. I'm going to be getting to really understanding what's wrong with the millennials today and what they don't understand. I want to share with you something fundamental before we apply it to the present day situation. And before we apply it to really understanding the roots of anti-Semitism in the past and today. I'm going to say it with a preface. Now, I'm saying this. I have been told by a goodly number, that's not one or two, goodly number, of college students from around the country. I'm talking about top institutions, Columbia, Princeton, Harvard, Yale, etc. And professors, not professors of politics, international relations, professors in various courses, who go out of their way to tell the Jewish students, listen carefully, because the quote is almost exact from all these places. Whatever your parents told you about Israel and the Palestinians is a lie. Whatever your parents told you is a lie. That's interesting. Uh, now, you can imagine young people go through an age of teenage rebellion no matter what. Adding to that is professors with the power of the grade behind them telling their students, your parents have lied to you. 
your parents continue to lie to you. And they do a litany of hate. Hate against Israel, hate against Jews. Did any of you read what happened in Duke University where, with government funds, they gave a quarter of a million dollars for this program. This guy gets up and does rap and says, I am an anti-Semite, let's sing. And I hate to be the only anti-Semite in the room, let's all sing. And he did great rap, which I can't do. How does that happen? And so I want to give you a short overview of a secret, which shouldn't be a secret. There is all the difference in the world between cause and a reason. What is the cause and what is the reason are two separate questions. For thousand, almost 2,000 years, what was the reason for anti-Semitism in Christian countries around the world? We're Christ killers. You killed our God. So first I would ask, but we didn't do it. The Romans did it. Oh, what does that have to do with it? You killed men directly because you go and he didn't know what to do. Pontius and then the slightest idea what happened historically, all they know was that Jews are responsible. And then I have another question, which I've asked a number of times in debates with priests. Do you know that Christianity says the only reason the world is saved is because Jesus died for our sins? So Jesus' death was a huge blessing. <laughs> he wouldn't have died. They would all be guilty. Guilty as hell and go to hell. So if the Jews did kill him, so we saved the world. That's a question they don't want to deal with. But I'm saying the whole thing is so illogical. You will say to me, but that's a reason. Let me tell you the difference between a reason and a cause. Suppose your kid gets up and says, you want to know why I, I don't get up to go to school? Because you never bought me an alarm clock. That's why I don't go to school. So the parents are okay. Said so he had bomb an alarm clock. Still doesn't get up and go to school. What happened? Well, that was a reason. But if you remove that reason, he'll give you another reason and another reason. So what's the real reason? The real reason is that he hates school and he doesn't want to get up. You will give a reason, but the way in which to tell whether that is the real reason or not is remove the reason. And then you will see what the true cause is. So they did this for centuries. They killed the Jews because the Jews killed Jesus. During the course of that time, there wasn't a ruler, a prince, a duke, who didn't recognize that if he got his people hepped up and got them to be against the Jews, every couple of years he could take all the property, all the goods, all the money that the Jews accumulated because these damn Jews don't deserve anything. The Jews were successful. Take it away. And the people all said hooray because they were the beneficiaries as well of this new wealth that they took away from the Jews. And then what happened? They let the Jews be kicked out for a number of years and then the kingdom's treasury began to sink because they needed the brains of the Jews. And, okay, come on back. And very often the Jews did because they had no alternative. So they come back and there we go again. But if it was, if it was because we are Christ kills, why'd you ever invite us back? Because we ran out of money. And so it went and went and went until the 1700s. And in the 1700s, the age of enlightenment and the age of reason and religion was not so important anymore, and you could no longer get everybody excited about Jews, the Christ killers. And so they figured out another reason. And in the 1800s, we saw the rise of nationalism across Europe and across the lands. Nationalism meant France said we need Frenchmen, and you have to have allegiance to your country. And Germany said, you must be a real German. You have to have allegiance to your country. And every place said, 
and the Jews don't really have allegiance to that country because they talk about Jerusalem. So what did the Jews do? What did they do in Germany? I don't mean to insult anybody here now, but I'm going to say it the way it is. After all, I live in New York and I can always go back. So what did the Jews in Germany say? Reformed Judaism created where they said, you know, they were accusing us of not caring, not being real Germans. We will be more German than the Germans. And, do you know this? You know how shuls became known as temples? It was because the Jews in Germany said, Nein! My German coming up. I spoke German as a kid. Here is unser Heimland. Und das ist unser Tempel. Here is our homeland, and this is our temple. In other words, if you took the reason as cause, then you said the real reason is because they think we're not real Germans. We will out-German the Germans, which is what they did in the 1800s, until, until, lo and behold, that didn't work too well, did it? That had a remarkable ending. But then when another possible reason worked its way into the psyche of a number of countries, and in particular Germany. The age of Darwin said there is such a thing as struggles for survival, and there's a genetic racial background, and people are defined by their genes, and the whole concept of race began to take over the minds of scientifically inclined nations, and in particular, Germany. Aha! The Jews are racially inferior. Now, when the Jews tried to tackle what the ostensible reason was by saying, oh, if it's because I murdered Jesus, then I'm not a Jew anymore and I will become a Christian. And if the cause was because I'm not nationalistic enough, no, I am a better German than you. And they were the ones who in World War I, you know, were the best fighters for Germany and thought that when they had their awards that this would save them some years later. And they would go to the offices of the Nazis and say, Aber ich hab das! And they would take it and throw it in the garbage and say, ha, 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 so what? You are a Jew! Back to Rabbi Goldstein. I am a Jew, and that's why he wanted to kill me, right? So, France, Dreyfus Affair, I can't give you a short course, but you know, you must know. So, France has the Dreyfus Affair, and there was a journalist who sees what's going on, and he says, enough! Why are they picking us? on us. I know, I have the answer. And what was Herzl's answer, Theodore Herzl? It's because we are different than any other people because we don't have a homeland. Well, that's the solution. Let's get a homeland, and by the way, he at first was not insistent upon Palestine, Israel, any land will do. There was an attempt to get him to take Uganda, he was willing, but they weren't okay. He understood the connection of the Jewish people with the land, and after all, we had been there never without a break for centuries, for millennia. Let's have the Jews go back to Israel. It wasn't called Israel yet, called Palestine, because we were, because we were Palestinians. Palestinians. Did you read this last week in the Times that Jesus was a Palestinian? Oh my God, I didn't know that. So he must have been a Muslim also. Uh, but Muslim Mohammed was born in 500 and something of the Common Era and died in 600 and something of the Common Era. But of course, all the Muslims that preceded Mohammed <laughs> we used to worship on the mount where the temple is and they had a mosque there before there were mosques in it. I do not believe the stupidity I hear. Yes, said Herzl. Last attempt. If we just get our country... If Jews go back to our land, 
then the nations won't think that we are a unique, different organism that is somehow so strange and unusual. No, we have a land like everybody else, and then Shalom al Yisrael. How did that work out? How did that work out? Rabbi Lau spoke last week for Yom HaShoah. He said, in Europe, they told us, get out and go back home. So we went back home, and they told us, and they tell us, get out and go back where you came from. So tell me, where shall I go? There's no place left for me. There's no place because there's no room. I tell you these things, they are so amazing in terms of inability to comprehend. Look, there are people now, there are Jews now, there are tons of millennials now. Let me tell you something about millennials. Millennials want to be idealistic and pure. And therefore, the people who are smart, the people who wrote the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, so to speak, the people who know how to use PR and how to use political lies in order to achieve their ends, they tell the students of today, colonialism, occupation, uh, real ownership of the land, displacement of Arabs from their ancient homeland. Every one of the countries in the Far East, every one of the, in the Middle East, I'm sorry, every one of those countries has artificial boundaries based on World War I. There's only one people that was on land uninterruptedly for millennia, and that's the Jews. And we were originally called Palestinians, yes. It was our land, and then when we came back, we, we are the ones who developed it. Mark Twain wrote that famous article about how when he went there, it was swampland, the Jews came and turned the desert into something productive and blooming and wonderful. So now, I thought it was supposed to be the solution, and they say it's not. Because, let me understand this. I could give you a list of 167 Muslim countries, Arab countries. I could tell you some history and tell you that the world in the League of Nations, the Peel Commission, the UN, all said, you know, the Jews, okay, give them a little, little place. Have you ever seen the pictures of the geography of Israel and of the Arab lands surrounding it. Do you know that the reason we have the borders and boundaries as we have them today is because they kept shrinking the right of the Jews to part of. It was originally a partition plan. It was originally the appeal. It was originally the League of Nations. It was originally, and we were supposed to have all of Jordan. And that's what Golda Meir for years said. They have Palestine because they have what we were supposed to have. Every single time we wanted to make peace, the cause was not because they wanted more land. They have more than enough land. What was the cause? Because we are Jews and do they, they do not want a single Jew to be there. Let's talk tachlis. I cannot understand. I cannot understand the young people today. I attribute it to the fact that millennials have good intentions, they're idealistic, and they are being so misled. They are, do you know that the, the recent survey was 66% of millennials today, youth, do not know what the Holocaust was. Not but aside from that, go and talk to anyone, 
any one of these college students, have you ever seen the interviews that uh, uh, they do on the college campuses? Who was involved in World War II? I think George Washington. I mean, it is incredible how they pass elementary school, how they get beyond high school, how they get into college is beyond me unless they have very wealthy parents, which I'm beginning to understand now is another factor, right? But it is incredible. So, if they don't understand, where do they get their information from? Do you know that there are people, people, uh, do you know how much money Al Jazeera, the Arab world, the uh, people who try to form public opinion spend on college campuses in order to pervert the thinking of Jewish youth. How do you get Jews who belong to BDS? Now, the founders of BDS have admitted, and I have some fantastic quotes about Goody and others, uh, when they were asked behind the scenes, what do you really want? It wasn't, uh, we, we want, uh, in Gaza, what we need is more, better economy, we need better jobs. Every time they get more money, what do they do? They build tunnels. The fortune that they invest in killing Jews. What do you want? So along come the Chachamim, this is sarcastic, the Jewish Chachamim, if you, you know what? Maybe if we just gave in to them and just give them what they want, then everything will be okay. All right? Give them what they want. Don't tell me the excuses. Tell me the cause. What do they want? They tell you. They tell you what they want. They want you dead. They want me dead. And you mean to tell me there are Jews who are in the forefront of these movements? Now, these Jews, very often they're kicked out of the groups fighting for BDS because you don't deserve to be with us. And these poor Jews, these teenagers, these, these youngsters, these college students cry, no, we want to be with you. No, we want to be in the battle. How do they convince people today? You can convince people of anything and everything. I am not going to be here today. I've overstayed my welcome anyway. I've, I've talked more than I promised I would, but I'm going to tell you what I have to say. How do you convince people today? Now, I found out something else about millennials. Millennials think that the greatest ideal is to be balanced and even-minded. This is the sickness of our generation. Balance and even-minded means, look, you have a point, but they also have a point. Yeah, and you know what? So if they have a point too, let's try. So let's try. So let's commit suicide and we'll try. And we have been trying for so long, but it never works because just as you're going to try to prove that you're more German than the Germans, or you're going to try to prove that you, you don't care for uh, killing, you, you, you're not guilty of killing their God, and every other time when they gave a reason that wasn't a reason, it was an excuse. That's not the reason. That's not the cause. The cause is because this teeny little country bugs them. Bugs them no end. Its existence bugs them. And they have to get rid of it. So Bargudi says, he said this, record it, I can show it to you. Our goal is not what we say it is. Our goal is to wipe out Israel and every Jew. That's the goal. Guess what? Hitler said the same thing in Mein Kampf. He didn't hide it, but the Jews never believe in the evil of somebody else which goes beyond their thinking. We are so good that what do we do? My children, two of my children made Aliyah, they live in Israel. Recently, uh, one was in the hospital, couldn't get a bed because the bed is taken by an Arab. I have no, no qualm about no problem with that. Okay, they had to wait, but there are Arabs. There are the husbands, the wives, the children of Arab terrorists or people who are dedicated to killing Jews, but their children are sent by the Arabs to Hadassah Hospital, to the other hospital, because they know they will be treated well. Yeah, but they also have a point, say our Chachamim. They also have a point. Anybody who believes in pay for slay does not have a point. 
anybody who believes that what we are to do in order to get decent treatment from the Israelis, their electricity is given to them by Israel. Their, their needs are met and they would be in a paradise in Gaza when Sharon said, let's try it. Let's try it. Let's give them whatever they want. And they gave them a nursery. A nursery, I don't mean for children, I mean plants, for plants. And they, it took a day and they destroyed it. There were millionaires, Jewish millionaires in America, who paid, gave money for the nursery and for all the things that were there, and they destroyed it. <sighs> Today, we live with the internet, and the internet is capable of spreading knowledge wonderful. And the internet is also capable of spreading disinformation. And you know what? No matter what you spread, it's just a, the Flat Earth Society, Flat Earth Society had a thing on Facebook. There'll be a meeting next week of Flat Earth adherents, believers, and the meeting will take place globally. <laughs> and around the world, around the world. Guess what? That's going to get 1,000 likes, 10,000 likes. No matter what you put there, everything is going to get likes, and therefore everybody feels like they're part of a group. And when they find that their professors, the people around them, are of a different mindset, our Jews are very malleable, and we want to get along, and we want to be the nice guy, and that's part of our psyche for so many years. You know what Freud said? It's a great line. Freud said, the Jews weren't oppressed for centuries because they killed Jesus. They were oppressed because they produced Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because we are behind religious idealism, spirituality, and the world fagintnish, if you know what that means. And like I said to you in the name of Hitler, the Jews are guilty of bringing a conscience to the world. So I have a plan. I have a great idea. And I'm going to close with this plan. Do you know that today people don't listen to you in America if you are white and a male, you got two strikes against you. If you're a Jew in this issue, three strikes against you. They don't want to hear what you have to say. It no, not, no matter, it doesn't matter who it's coming, it, it doesn't matter what you're saying, it's who it's coming from. So I gave you this great sheer, this great lecture. I explained so many things to you. And a millennial will hear it. Eh, that's a rabbi. Somebody told me this, a young person today. I had never seen it in this light. It is a fascinating insight. He said, do you remember when you came to America? Talk to me. You remember how because your parents were immigrants, you thought they were stupid for the longest time? I mean, my parents couldn't speak English. So my father, who's a genius in Talmud, I used to think he, was, he wasn't really smart. Because if you don't speak the language, so children think nothing. The language today is computerese, Twitter, Facebook. The old generation, I don't just mean the old generation, this young man who is 25 years old said, for the 20 year old, I'm an immigrant. For the 20 year old today, I'm an immigrant because I don't speak their language anymore. Today, you must be a part of the language of youth. And so therefore, I saw the title and it hit me immediately. Losing our youth. We are losing them because they're being brainwashed all over and it isn't so hard to do when they have no knowledge. Everything that I've said so far. 
I suggest a campaign, not losing our youth, but using our youth. The only ones that our youth will listen to. Whatever I said is great, but a rabbi said it. It's his business. Okay, and there's another side. There's another side to it, and you got to listen to the other narrative too. And and you know what? He wasn't even fair because the way he phrased it wasn't really fair to the Arabs. And it really is. They have a good point. And yes, and if they pay to slay, it's because you have to. And I already saw today five hundred rockets from Gaza. Beit Shemesh. My kids live in Beit Shemesh. They were in. They're trying to save their lives. And you know what the headline in Jazeera was? Palestinian mother and child die. No background whatsoever. Like we started it. <sighs> Young people love fairness. Yes. Tell me. They think that we are Goliath, not the David of old. And so therefore they hate the Jews. We're not Goliath because we can't do whatever we want because morality constrains us. Because it will be a simple thing to win in Gaza. Nikki Haley said, why don't the Jews react like any other nation in the world would? Nikki Haley. But we don't. You don't think we can clean out all of them, but we would get some hospitals. Yes, because that's where they built their munitions and that's where they're sending the rockets from. You don't think we could kill them, but there some children would be killed. So we send a knock first. And a, what is this? War is war, I thought, and war is hell. And we're not going to make war heaven. But again, it's only a rabbi speaking, so what am I getting to? Okay, I'm almost finished. What I'm getting to is... Some people of means should get together and create youth leadership that A, can be taught how to respond. They have to respond. Rabbi Blech, again, Rabbi. I mean, take the things that I have said, broaden them, flesh them out, Make all this so clear that anyone would have to follow and then say, yeah, there is a narrative for them and a narrative for us, and I don't mean to destroy their narrative, but their narrative compared to our narrative is so weak that I believe in two sides, but I don't believe in suicide. And I would say... Get the wealthy people or the people of moderate means and make this priority number one. Not losing our youth, but using our youth. We have to develop the leaders from amongst the bright and talented, and there are countless of those. We're pretty smart people. Get those kids to understand, forgive me for calling them the kids, Get those young people, get those talented people to become leaders by giving them more information and more imbuing them with the need to recognize and acknowledge their Jewish identity. Make them more Jewish because otherwise, as you said to me before, what is the last link between Jews and their faith. Last link is Israel. Israel. When that goes, we've lost them entirely. And when now they have become enemies of Israel, that is unbelievable and unforgivable. And we have to turn our children from enemies into leaders in the forefront of the fight for recognition of the correctness, the validity, the ultimate importance of Israel because the evangelical priest was right. As the Jews go, so goes the world. 
There is a sickness now, and we've got to contain that sickness. I would call it, in light of what's going on with measles, vaccination. We have to vaccinate our youth against the terrible misinformation and the terrible apathy that is part and parcel of colleges and college education today. Last thing I'm going to say. There's a great line Mark Twain said. It's interesting, he says, uh, when I was 16 years old, my father was so stupid. He didn't understand anything about the world or anything about anything. And five years later, it's amazing how much my father learned in those five years. Yeah, amazing. So I may be older and I may be written off. We started with my age, yes. Anyway, oh, oh man, what does he know? I know history. I've dedicated my life to understanding the importance of Jewish survival. And I see these kids, they're going to be lost. Yes, they could be lost. And the title was a very sad title. It might have turned off some people losing our youth. So that's why I say change the title. Change the battle using our youth. Let's use the most precious commodity and the most powerful commodity we have, the idealism of the millennials, the potential of the millennials, the goodness of the millennials, and let that become the key to turning it around so that Am Yisrael Chai becomes the theme, not only of the AKs in the room and all of us, but of all Jewish youth. We will survive. That's what Rabbi Goldstein said, be strong and we will survive.